Hello, welcome to the Science for Policy podcast. My name's Toby, and today I'm joined by Dr. Salvatore Arico. Dr. Arico is the Chief Executive Officer of the International Science Council, a global organization which aims to bring together and amplify scientific expertise on issues of global importance. Um, he has a background in marine sciences. He's previously worked as Head of Ocean Science at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and as Executive Secretary of the United Nations Secretary General's Scientific Advisory Board, among many other roles. So, Salvatore, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. It sounds like you have quite the background at the science policy interface. And with some guests, I like to ask them, how did you transition from your own research area into the more general science for policy field? But given that your research area was always ocean sciences, perhaps this comes a bit more naturally to you because it is so policy focused anyway? Well, yes and no, in the sense that when I started after my PhD uh, a long time ago, I was very much interested in uh, the interface between science and policy, but uh, such an interface uh, was not really existing. It was uh, in its very infancy. So uh, I was part of uh, what I considered to be a social experiment, which was about bearing uh, the findings of scientific research to meet the, the needs of policymakers. But as I say, it was very much at the beginning of uh, what is now called the science policy interface. Mm -hmm. And where was this experiment happening? Where were you working at the start? At the beginning, uh, my first experience was precisely in uh, relation to uh, marine biodiversity, starting with uh, integrated coastal management, but eventually moving on to an emerging issue related to, to bioprospecting of genetic resources from the deep seabed, for which there was no legal, no policy regime. Uh -huh. And I guess this was at the international level. This, was it the United Nations? That's correct. Uh, basically, I was involved uh, in uh, the early days of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is one of the real conventions together with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. Mm -hmm. And from the very beginning, uh, there were um, issues related to... Um, biodiversity in national jurisdiction, under national jurisdiction versus uh, biodiversity uh, and uh, resources, generally speaking, uh, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And uh, one of those was precisely uh, how to access uh, the so-called genetic resources of the deep seabed. And in particular, it was clear that uh, that was a prerogative of a lucky few due to the fact that the technology involved is extremely sophisticated and expensive, uh, similar to uh, space technology. So the Global South uh, was wondering uh, the international community would go about access to those resources and uh, the sharing of the benefits arising from the utilization of those resources. And that was one of my um, first uh, uh, exposures to the question of uh, science advice to governments, especially in the context of uh, international negotiations uh, um, under the auspices of the UN. Great. We often talk on this podcast about science advice and how it works at national level in individual countries, uh, and indeed at international, well, as the UN call it, regional level, so as the European Union and so on. But we've only occasionally touched on global level science advice, maybe only, I don't know, two or three times in, in 70 episodes or so. What I took away from those conversations, though, is that the way science advice works and is approached globally is really very different indeed from the way it works at other levels. Is that also your impression? That's definitely my impression. I think that uh, if one uh, takes a step back, uh, we uh, could agree uh, both the the community of uh, science uh, policy practitioners, but also the academicians that uh, have been analyzing uh, the, the history and the dynamics of uh, uh, science to policy advice. The Montreal Protocol on ozone depletion is, uh, uh, tends to be recognized as the first uh, example of uh, science advice and uh, science policy advice at the global level. But if one scratches the surface a little bit, uh, you would realize that uh, it was an initiative 
by a bunch of scientists and uh, in fact uh, uh, there was one individual in particular who ended up uh, later a few years later uh, as the chair of the IPCC Sir uh, Robert Watson uh, also called uh, Bob Watson who uh, at that time was with NASA and uh, in particular NASA's uh, mission to planet Earth and had the idea of pulling together the science of ozone depletion in the form of a, an assessment, which was essentially an assessment of the knowledge that we had about the issue, but in a language accessible to policymakers. And that is considered to be some kind of an experiment that eventually worked beautifully and led uh, countries in uh, in, in front of such clear evidence uh, to agree on, uh, on a multilateral treaty and uh, the creation of a dedicated fund. Hmm. It's interesting you describe it as an initiative started by a bunch of scientists. Are you saying this stuff was built bottom up, so not, not a policymaker or an institution saying, hey, we need some science advice here, but rather scientists essentially getting involved in advocacy for, for their work and its relevance? That's exactly the case. Uh, it was a bottom-up initiative uh, of uh, what we could call, define as uh, responsible science advocacy, essentially alerting policymakers in the first place rather than society at large on a, a risk but also a, an opportunity that is to counteract uh, the problem of ozone depletion in this particular case and uh, so it happens that at that time alternative technologies uh, were available and uh, therefore it was rather easy to put in place a mechanism of technology transfer uh, that eventually paved the ground for uh, this particular problem to be solved or at least for us to make progress with it. And uh, 25, 30 years later, we are faced with uh, one of the few uh, success stories in the history of uh, science policy advice. <laughs> All right. Ouch. Okay, good. So, so let's talk about now. Where are we in science advice let's say specifically on the global stage, 25 or 30 years later, what's the state of the art? I think uh, the practice of science policy advice and the underpinning of theory has matured a lot. There have been uh, multiple examples at the global level in multiple areas. But I wanted to say that those, uh, not just examples, but uh, those uh, cases uh, uh, have allowed to also develop a robust theory of the science policy advice at the global level and uh, particularly a, a few basic principles. So if you allow me to go through quickly, I, I think it's important to first of all recognize the importance that uh, the fact that science policy advice has to be relevant, uh, science advice has to be policy relevant, not policy descriptive, this is uh, a, an assumption, a principle that uh, many uh, tend to refer to and to the point that nowadays we tend to give it for granted. And yet this is a, an important reminder to all of us, that is to say that the language of science advice policy has to be crafted very carefully because otherwise it's so easy for governments who may not be aligned with that particular piece of uh, science advice to dismiss that. So policy relevance, uh, but um, making sure that uh, science advice is not policy prescriptive. Okay, hang on. So sorry to interrupt, but this is interesting. So of course, a lot of people talk about the importance of crafting the language when you're giving science advice. But I think commonly what's meant there is literally the, the language, you know, the words, it shouldn't be too technical. It should use terms that policymakers are used to and the explanation should be accessible and so on. But it seems like you're saying something slightly different here. You're saying that it needs to be constructed, as it were, defensively, so it's kind of dismissal proof. Absolutely. I can give you a concrete example. I remember there was a, an episode of coral bleaching in, uh, in the late 90s that uh, the international community, both the scientific community but also policy community, was very much worried about and of course we are faced with climate variability but increasingly climate change and eventually the two operate in a synergistic way. 
And uh, there was a, um, a discussion in the context of the scientific body of the Commission on Biological Diversity, it's called uh, the Subsidiary Body for Scientific, Technical and Technological Advice, on uh, what uh, drives coral bleaching. And obviously, coral bleaching is about uh, uh, coral systems uh, losing uh, their basic uh, functions in the, and, and, and therefore you, the, the whole livelihood systems that uh, are dependent on those systems, especially in the global south, uh, would collapse, uh, namely artisanal fisheries and, uh, and also tourism. So it was an issue of uh, not just uh, uh, ecological concern, but also social and economic uh, preoccupation. And uh, there was a whole discussion about to which extent uh, climate change was the main uh, driver when it comes to coral bleaching. And, uh, and they are, the tension was between those countries that wanted uh, climate change to be listed as uh, one of the drivers at the same level as, uh, let's say, eutrophication, um, over uh, sedimentation or siltation, degradation of the physical uh, habitat, and others uh, who were pushing for climate change to be, if not singled out, but to be recognized as the main factor for uh, uh, the increase in the intensity and uh, frequency of this particular phenomenon, coral bleaching. And at the end of the day, the evidence was pretty clear. Uh, uh, the Convention of Biological Diversity at that time uh, was uh, enjoying a certain freedom of uh, thinking and action in terms of being able for the Secretariat to be able to pull together expert groups made of uh, the top-notch scientists in that particular area. And I remember I was with the CPD Secretariat and we were able to pull together a report to inform a, an expert consultation on coral bleaching, which was essentially a great piece of science, but um, in a policy-friendly language. And the report was crystal clear that climate change uh, had a central role when it comes to uh, the intensity, the increased intensity and frequency of, of coral bleaching. So with that piece of evidence and also pre presented in the right language, which was definitely not policy prescriptive, but very authoritative uh, scientifically, well, at the end of the day, even the skeptics uh, ended up accepting uh, that piece of uh, advice. And uh, the uh, resulting uh, resolution uh, of uh, the convention, the conference of the parties to the CBD clearly stated that climate change was uh, uh, responsible for uh, an increasing intensity and frequency of coral bleaching events all over the world. Right, so by policy relevance, you don't just mean something that's relevant to what policymakers are working on, but also something that it's, as it were, within their domain to act on, so they can see how they can take it forward. Yes, absolutely. Policy relevance is one that has to be there. Uh, mm. Because de facto you are responding to a demand up there, and without a what I would call a policy enabling framework, even a a societal relevant piece of evidence may not be picked up by those who are responsible for taking decisions, policy makers. So policy relevance is one. The others kind of go without saying when it comes to saliency, cogency. Uh, that advice has to be expressed in a way which is uh, which is clear, which is really uh, cogent and uh, and and also salient. That is to say, short and 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 sweet, so to speak, uh, short and clear. But at the same time, there is a whole uh, challenge when it comes to translating complex uh, uh, issues into a language that is accessible, and yet. I think the scientific community is uh, getting there gradually, and I, this is a, a point I'd like to elaborate uh, on a little bit. And, and perhaps the, the last main criteria principle is timeliness. Uh, that is to say that there has to be good matchmaking between uh, the priorities and timeliness of uh, the policy community with what the scientific community may have to say. But it can go in the other way around as well. The scientific community can raise issues which are not yet on the policy radar, on the radar of policymakers. So it's really a, a dialogue and increasingly so.
Okay, great. And you said you think the science advice community globally is getting there in terms of having the structures in place to put those principles into practice to make science advice effective. Yes, I, th I think on the one hand, the policy community is now recognizing that uh, there is a need for appropriate mechanisms uh, to um, operationalize uh, the function of uh, science uh, advice to policy making. So, um, and on the other hand, uh, the international scientific community is becoming better and better in explaining complex issues in a way which is accessible and uh, digestible uh, by policy makers. So I'd like to give an example of uh, what's happening at both uh, sides of, this, of the spectrum. When it comes to policy uh, advice mechanisms, science policy advice mechanisms at the global level, there is a very interesting development as we speak uh, that is uh, taking uh, unfolding in at the level of the United Nations. In fact, both in terms of member states, the, the, the General Assembly and uh, the Secretariat. In uh, terms of member states, uh, UN member states, under the, the leadership of uh, the current president of the General Assembly, uh, Ambassador Koroshi, they are increasingly recognized uh, the importance of uh, actionable knowledge, that is to say, science and uh, evidence-based uh, policy making. And um, for that reason, uh, we expect uh, a group of subset of the UN member states to constitute a group of friends around science, which uh, will be a very interesting and uh, rather novel uh, development in the UN. Normally, you have group of friends organized around uh, issues of common uh, interest in terms of uh, domestic, uh, political and economic agendas. In this case, it's, it's really uh, almost an advocacy, a science advocacy uh, initiative initiated by member states and uh, facilitated also by the International Science Council. Okay, and that's at a political level. So that's the member states themselves, as it were, self-organizing rather than something the scientists are doing. Absolutely. But yeah, interesting. It is interesting because uh, one can consider that as a an indication of the fact that member states are finally recognizing the importance of embedding science advice in, in, in the practice of policy making. So uh, I, I find it very interesting that they are the ones taking the initiative. On the other hand, uh, at the level of the Secretariat of the UN, which discharges uh, uh, administrative functions, but uh, the Secretariat of the UN also contains portions which are scientific and technical you know, branches of the UN Secretariat. There is an, an intention by the Secretary General to re-establish the Scientific Advisory Board uh, of the UN. A couple of years ago, there was an, a first uh, ever attempt uh, to formalize uh, science advice in the context of the UN. I had the, the privilege to be involved in that exercise, the first uh, UN Secretary General's Scientific Advisory Board established by former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And at that time, it was essentially a group of uh, experts uh, dealing with uh, a number of uh, questions uh, on the uh, global policy agenda and uh, providing advice to policymakers. But it appears that uh, this time, in addition to a group of independent members, the Secretary General uh, intends to also rely on, uh, first of all, a number of uh, uh, chief scientists that uh, have been appointed within individual UN organizations, which is something that did not exist until a few years ago. But additionally, there is an intention to um, add a, a, an outer uh, circle, uh, so to speak, whereby the, sec the scientific advisory board will be able to interact uh, with the uh, active international, with the scientific uh, community at the international level. So that is a an initiative that complements uh, what I what I mentioned about uh, member states wanting to create, uh, organize themselves around uh, actionable knowledge uh, through a group of friends. And on the other hand, the Secretariat responding also with a scientific advisory board that would be made not just of a group of renowned experts, but which would also embed a mechanism to liaise with the 
active scientific community. And the International Science Council is planning to help in that respect, especially when it comes to interfacing with the scientists themselves. I see. So the role of the ISC would be as an interface between the UN and the scientific community, like a matchmaker, as it were. Yes, someone has to operationalize that interface between the scientific advisory board of the UN and the active uh, international scientific community. An organization like the International Science Council is in a position really to gather the views and aspirations, knowledge of the active science community in a, in a bottom-up way, especially because we have the aspiration to become something else, I mean, something more than a federation of national science academies. National science academies are very important when it comes to federating science activities at the national level. The International Science Council in 2018 was kind of reformed following the merger of uh, an organization called uh, the International Council for Science, which used to federate natural sciences uh, uh, academies and uh, organizations with uh, the International Social Science Council, which uh, used to federate academies of social and human sciences and uh, other science organizations in that area. So interdisciplinarity, increasingly transdisciplinarity is happening and we are walking the talk on that. But uh, at the same time, there is a need for science to reach out to society, get out of its ivory tower, and uh, get uh, their hands a bit more wet with uh, some of those societal problems while maintaining a freedom of uh, thinking and, and action. Okay, so this is really interesting. If we may, I'd like to get into the details of this a bit, because saying that the ISC will connect the scientific community with policymakers or perhaps with the policymakers uh, advisory board or whatever, that could mean different things in, in different contexts. So you could be talking about being a matchmaker, you know, connecting parts of the community with the policymakers as needed. Um, another role there could be more as a kind of evidence synthesizer where you might do that knowledge synthesis work yourself or commission it or put together working groups or whatever. Um, I suppose a third possible role could be for the ISC to become a full-on knowledge broker, right? You know, get your hands dirty, engaging with the scientific and the political sides to provide a, a more a holistic science for policy service, right? So there's various different models here, and I'd love to hear a bit more about the shape you see this new mechanism taking, if you have a clear idea of that, of course. Absolutely, absolutely. I completely agree. The function of science advice to policy is definitely a, not just a, a matter of uh, uh, synthesis, uh, digesting uh, scientific evidence into uh, the policy language, it's a, it's a brokerage kind of function. So, for example, when um, uh, looking at the future of science, and in particular the future of science systems, there are so many players around the table that need to be mobilized, and it's not just policymakers, it also is uh, the funders of uh, research, uh, the publishers, and, you know, to a certain extent, the public as well, because we are facing a big crisis uh, related to trust in science, uh, trust in science, misinformation, miscommunication, mistrust. So the International Science Council is uh, adopting a systems approach to the science enterprise. And uh, science advice to policy becomes one important element of the interface with science, with, in this case, policy making. But there are other actors, other stakeholders that we are increasingly interfacing with. So we do see the International Science Council helping and uh, with, with that important brokerage function, absolutely. Now, when it comes to uh, specific uh, issues, uh, specific uh, priorities, um, be those climate change or inequality, um, social justice, um, also the impact of uh, conflicts on uh, science and science, uh, on scientists and science systems, there are a lot of actors out there. For example, the, the active uh, research community uh, working uh, in the area of global change. But again, there is a need for some brokerage role and the interface with uh, 
the policy community because uh, initiatives uh, such as the World Climate Research Program, Future Earth, no matter how strong they are from a scientific standpoint, there is a lack of culture within the scientific community when it comes to the language of policy making and, uh, and how to interface with uh, actors and stakeholders other than scientists themselves. So we, we see that the interface role as very important and, as I said, not just the interface of science with policy, but also with the other stakeholders in society that are affected by knowledge generated through science. Hmm. I have to ask, how politically welcome is science advice in these kinds of multilateral scenes. I mean, the reason I ask, I did an interview a long time ago now with someone who studies the science advice mechanism that exists for Antarctica, the continent of Antarctica. And one of the points she made was that the governance system there is this kind of very sensitive, very carefully defined and finely balanced multilateral system, which which kind of exists to reconcile and balance different national interests and, and generate compromises. And sometimes in those kinds of systems, it can be hard to see quite where science can usefully join the conversation because, you know, the need for balance and compromise and, and consensus are just too dominant to leave much space for other considerations. And I wonder, this shows my ignorance a bit about how the UN works perhaps, but I wonder whether there are enough opportunities at UN level to land science advice where it doesn't just get crowded out by political multilateral negotiations? I think it's a very good question and uh, the answer, uh, my answer would be a bit more optimistic and uh, uh, than uh, this specific example related to the, the Antarctic uh, uh, Treaty. I think it's a matter of language. It's a matter of how that science advice is presented. I remember a couple of years ago, I saw a wonderful report uh, on illegal, uh, unregulated and unreported uh, fishing by Greenpeace International. Uh, I happen to be a, a, a biological oceanographer and I, I read that report with a great interest and frankly, it was a great piece of work. But it got completely ignored by member states. It, it had been tabled at one particular negotiation on biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction, which is a process that uh, it took some 15 years uh, for uh, member states to agree that uh, there will be a treaty to regulate access to uh, biodiversity in areas not beyond national jurisdiction. But that, that piece of work, uh, which was really a, a piece of science advice by that particular organization, got ignored because maybe the advocacy reputation of Greenpeace International, which is doing a fantastic job, but uh, which is not seen as an organization operating at the interface of science with policy. So no matter how good the contents of those reports would be, policymakers would be suspicious and also would not be really in a position to use those uh, findings and that advice. And in parallel, there were other reports, for example, from the United Nations University, which were saying the same things, but phrased in a way which was more prone to the language, and I would say even thinking of policymakers, because at the end of the day, we are talking about different epistemological communities. So the articulation of the dialogue is as important as the content of that science advice. So I think I would be rather optimistic in, in, in asserting that the, the level of acceptance of uh, advice from the scientific community on behalf of uh, member states, policymakers, in the context of the UN has increased a lot. Yeah, OK, well, that's good to hear. Now, the other question I have, which again, I think shows my ignorance a bit of the way the UN actually works, because I'm just kind of imagining possible problems and hoping you can confirm or deny. My other question is about how this structure interacts with the national level and I suppose the regional level. What I'm thinking here is um, the parties to UN decision making are 
national governments and bodies like the EU and I'm sure many others, but that's the basic idea, right? And these parties all have their own sources of science advice anyway, which they can bring with them to the table if they want. So does the UN have enough decision-making autonomy of its own to really make use of a layer of science advice there over and above the existing stuff that its constituent members already have, if that makes sense? I think this is a very interesting question because the answer is uh, no uh, to a certain extent in the sense that uh, governments uh, remain sovereign and uh, science advice uh, or, or, you know, let's say uh, UN uh, decisions based on science advice may also face a certain level of resistance when it comes to let's say, alternative uh, uh, science advice uh, uh, by uh, the national level in, in the case of some governments. Yeah, it doesn't have to be rival science advice. It could just be duplication. You know, do you add any value by doing it again at UN level? However, there is a, an increased effort in uh, trying to bridge science advice uh, throughout multiple scales. At the national level, we uh, experience different models of science advice in the first place. When it comes to bridging uh, those efforts with, uh, uh, say, science advice at the regional level, uh, be that in, you know, for Latin America and the Caribbean or Africa and ultimately the UN, there are mechanisms uh, that the individual UN organizations are putting in place, uh, which are pretty much soft mechanisms based on uh, foresight rather than uh, science advice per se. I mean, science advice is, uh, of course, uh, the, the goal, uh, but those mechanisms are perhaps a softer mechanism informing, uh, ultimately, science advice at the level of the UN as a whole. So I think with time, uh, those efforts are being bridged increasingly and uh, more and more effectively. But yet, there is a we will always be faced with a, a situation whereby, even if the UN has taken certain decisions based on science advice. It's a prerogative of individual governments uh, to follow that or not. I guess then, I mean, because you can imagine different motivations for not following that. I mean, there's a political motivation, of course, but there's also just the possibility that the science advice people have access to is different in what it says. So I guess the higher level you go, the more consensus-based your science advice has to be. The higher you, uh, level you go, the, the more diluted uh, that science advice uh, unavoidably ends up to be, uh, unfortunately. And it's not only a matter of political correctness, it also is a matter of what science means and, and uh, how science operates in different contexts. For example, in, uh, uh, of course, uh, I'm generalizing here, but in the Global South, but I'll give examples in countries like uh, India, which of course is a major economy in transition, where you have a lot of great science efforts going on, and still uh, development-related issues. Science is very close to societal problems. Uh, paradoxically closer than uh, in the European context, which continues to be very much uh, related to knowledge generation, although there is an increasing pressure on uh, science to deliver solutions uh, on, the, on the ground, even uh, in the European context. There are also issues of a cultural nature. Science uh, would need to take into account other forms of knowledge, uh, in particular so the knowledge of indigenous local communities, even in a, in a reality like faced by a country like Australia, where, for example, um, fire management practices continue to be, base, to be based largely on indigenous knowledge, and yet that knowledge is not captured by um, landscape management policies. And, and thirdly, there is a, also a, an issue related to language, I think. Um, in the sense that uh, uh, science advice is also increasingly present in uh, the, the literature, but language barriers uh, are such that uh, knowledge cannot be necessarily taken into account and embedded in uh, contexts other than Anglophone contexts. So there are a number of barriers in place. 
But overall, I would say that the practice of science advice to policy is uh, the notion is is increasingly accepted and uh, made room for. Sure, that absolutely makes sense. But in a way, some of what you said is the other side of the coin to this important principle you mentioned a while ago of policy relevance. Because as we just said, there's always the risk that the higher you go, the more diluted the science advice becomes, the more kind of lowest common denominator it is required to be. And one reason for that might be that there's this tension between being independent, where the scientists are free to tell it straight, you know, tell it like it is, and being politically relevant, where they also have to think, we'd better make sure that our advice works for for all of our extremely broad and politically diverse audience and they can actually use it. And those two imperatives can pull in different directions. I mean, this is not a problem that's unique to the UN, of course, but it does strike me that it must rear its head a lot at global level. The system is so multilateral and everything requires compromise and consensus. There's no central authority. It is, uh, and that's why the International Science Council uh, um, defends and promotes the principle of freedom and responsibility of science. So far, this principle has been applied from the point of view of uh, scientists being able to uh, operate freely from uh, uh, any influence uh, by governments in particular. Of course, that's not all, always the case. There are a number of cases with which the International Science Council uh, deals related precisely to the fact that uh, some uh, individual scientists uh, or scientific organizations are under pressure and uh, the influence of some governments or the censorship of some governments. The principle, uh, the second part of that principle relates to uh, the responsibility in conducting uh, science, uh, which is on the one hand about uh, integrity of scientists in uh, the way that they work, but increasingly also a uh, societal, the societal responsibility of scientists uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, helping uh, craft uh, some solutions to the problems that society f- faces while maintaining uh, their independence and freedom of, of thinking and, and action. So uh, it's a delicate balance to strike, and, and, and yet if uh, scientists uh, do not accept the rules of policy making and the fact that they themselves have to not necessarily dilute the, the discourse but accept some compromise and the compromise is not in the in the substance the compromise is in what may or may not be possible to uh, respond to and achieve from a policy making perspective so at the end of the day science advice is about saying uh, this is what we know this is what we don't know. These are the options, and these are the implications of the options. And policymakers may say, well, this is a great piece of advice, but we are not yet in a position to respond, not just because of political considerations, but also because of the reality of policy making, how policies are developed and, and implemented and, and monitored and evaluated. Hmm. Yeah, I'm tempted to say good luck with it all because it sounds like a very delicate balance to strike. And I guess it will be a different balance topic by topic, depending on the, the details and the sense. Absolutely. Yeah. At the same time, the dialogue is a, a fruitful one uh, for both constituencies. I'll give a concrete example. The, the last report by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is recognizing the need for geoengineering, actually to be more specifically for the the capture and storage of CO2. Uh, From a risk management perspective, uh, we know that uh, capturing the CO2 and and also the storage of CO2 in particular uh, entails a number of uh, uh, risks, especially if implemented at a planetary scale. And yet we must have that kind of dialogue in the context of the Paris Agreement, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So um, sometimes the goal, especially when it comes to issues uh, for which uh, we still have a number of uh, more question marks than answers, the goal is really to have a debate, to put the knowledge we have and the options we have on the table and look at those from uh, not just the science angle, but also the policy angle. Because uh, co-designing the research agenda uh, 
by taking into account uh, the views and aspirations of stakeholders other than scientists is important to science as much as listening to relevant and timely science advice is important to policymakers. Yeah, so that's very interesting. The role of the science brokering organization in helping to bring together a community to shape the research agenda. That's a whole different uh, area where science advice is needed, I guess, quite advi- quite apart from science ad- advice for policy directly. There's one last question I wanted to ask you, and it's, as it were, directly on behalf of our audience. Um, I'm quite often asked, people <laughs> somehow imagine that I know the answer, I don't know why, um, how can an individual scientist get involved in this world? So if you're a scientist working on whatever topic somewhere in the world and you feel like you have something to offer to science advice at a global level, is there a way that you can do that? And I often find this question quite hard to answer. I mean, I know the answer at European level, but it's quite complicated and quite unhelpful often. I wonder whether you have any advice for listeners who might be in that situation. So the International Science Council is trying to uh, walk the talk on uh, this notion of uh, science engagement. And uh, despite uh, the fact that uh, the IAC is a membership organization, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the interview, it is uh, its membership is made of national academies, international science unions. There also is a, you know, I would say, I would almost call it a moral obligation to reach out to individual scientists and provide those interested and capable to do so with the opportunity to participate in the uh, in the dynamics and uh, the, the, the efforts related to science advice. The way we are doing that is, and we are still testing that, but so far so good, is by issuing uh, uh, calls for expression of interest by individual scientists to participate in some of those science to policy efforts that the IC is conducting. One uh, is, for example, uh, a foresight on uh, environmental uh, priorities uh, exercise that uh, the IC is coordinating for the UN Environment Programme. Another one uh, is um, uh, a study in which we are about to embark jointly with the World uh, Health Organization on uh, reduction of subjective well-being in uh, young people or, if you like, youth mental health together with uh, WHO. So what we do basically, uh, and this is really new, we have been doing this in the past few months, is that we issue a call and the individual uh, scientists have the opportunity to apply and be uh, considered, and I'm afraid it's on a pro bono basis, for participating in those exercises which uh, aim at providing science advice to policy on specific uh, uh, issues, in some cases of a topical nature, in some uh, other cases of a cross-cutting nature, for example, disaster risk reduction in the context of the Sendai strategy. Okay, so scientists will hear about this how? Through their academies, through their own employers? That's correct, um, through the national academies and the international scientific unions and also openly through the IAC website because we are not uh, limiting ourselves to nominations by the members, but they can also be self-nominations. So I would say if you have uh, individual scientists interested in participating uh, of course, being considered in the first place of four, and if uh, retained, selected, participating in those science advice to policy exercises, do send them to us. Yeah, I'll put the link to the ISC website in the show notes for this episode, and I hope you get some interest. Um, well, this has been a great conversation, and I appreciate your sharing your huge experience in this domain of science advice, which is clearly very important, if not always at the forefront of our minds, those of us who work at less exalted levels. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I have the sense that uh, the discourse on uh, science uh, advice to policy is uh, not just a discourse. Uh, It's not a discourse anymore. It has really become a reality. And I very much appreciate this opportunity so that we can spread the message and uh, make sure that science advice to policy and also uh, for scientists to be able to take on board the 
the, the needs of policymakers uh, become part of the mainstream. Well, you're most welcome. I hope so too. The Science for Policy podcast is created by Sapea. It's produced by me, Toby Wardman, with additional research and support from Agnieszka Pietruchuk. Sapea is a consortium of Europe's academy networks representing more than 100 academies, young academies and learning societies from more than 40 countries across Europe. We're part of the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism and as such we're funded by the European Union. Having said that, the opinions you hear on this podcast are those of the guests and sometimes mine, but certainly not the views of the European Commission. This music is composed by Carlo Alfredo Piatti and performed by Elisaveta Suschenko. And this last bit is particularly good.